Hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, hang on a minute. Whoops. Let's see. Gotta get that right. I, I've got to turn my sound up. Uh oh. There we go. Boy, I know ne I know as as the soft voice. That's the headphones. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. You can hear me though? I can. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start this out with, I have a couple of slides so I can go through our upcoming events and a couple of instructions. And then I will introduce you. And if you look on the bottom of your screen, there is a green button called share screen. Yeah. Um, Press so, on that. So that will allow you to put up your PowerPoint or whatever you have. Oh, but you don't have, okay, it says host disabled, but you'll do that. Okay, let me. Okay, that should let you share it. So, I'm okay, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to just to practice. Okay. Oh. So I'm putting up mine and then you should be able to when we're ready to start your part of the program if you want to try to share again. And just to make sure that that preempts my screen. Like that works. There you go. All right. So that'll work. Um, generally, um, what I do since I had, I don't set up these programs, um, <clears throat> with registration and passwords and all that other stuff. Um, I saw that. Yeah. Um, the attendees can't share their you know, pictures or really talk. Um, so I ask them to share their questions through the, the Q&A function. And then after you're finished, um, we'll go through and I'll read you the questions. Okay. That seems to work best. I'm going to share my screen again. And then I don't know if you've given any further thought to um, polls or any questions? Yeah, I, I guess I only <laughs> thought about it a little bit just recently. Um, 
I know that people like to do this, especially if it's a class and and, and just try to keep people's attentions. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I just thought of, of one. I mean, one would be right at the beginning. That doesn't really do anything. Um, uh, so these have to be yes or no. Is that right? No, not necessarily. Okay. Um, okay. So one thought is after I finish the grass section, I could say, name one of the grasses that picks your, piques your interest. Okay, let me see if we have to, hang on a minute. Honey. Oh. Um, what we have, what we need to do is, um, so name a grass that piques your interest. So what are, are we, we've got to make it like a multiple choice. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> so are there a series of grasses that you go through? Yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them, so. Too many to. Hmm. Too many to put on. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that, well, <clears throat> um, let me, Sorry, I'm just trying to check out. Yeah, I guess we we sort of could do it through chat, but that makes it hard to, you know, figure out who's yes. um, hmm. now what I could do what I could do is as we go along um, just list you know, as you go through your presentation, just list these as you go. Yeah, I guess the only other would be you know, just lumping some, like there's a whole bunch of blue stems. Yeah. A couple love this. Lopsided Indian grass. Um, 
the grasses. Yeah. Oops. Let's see, maybe there has to be muley grass. Oh, I was going to leave that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Just think, because everybody knows the one to see what else they yeah. might be interested in. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's a whole section on mooly grass, but um, yeah. Okay. What did I say? Love grasses, blue stems, uh, upside to Indian grass. Yeah. How about that? Okay. Um. So maybe we want to change the question to um, which grasses were new to you or uh, we, can, we can leave it at that. Okay. And I will try to. And if somebody remembers a particular one, um, can they put that in chat just for interest? Um, yeah, maybe. I can try to edit it as we go. OK. Um, let me make sure. OK, we've got people joining. Okay, everyone who's joined us, um, if you, could you raise your hand if you can see the screen and hear us? Great, sounds like, or looks like everyone can and see. Okay, we're gonna give, um, give it a few more minutes for more attendees to join us. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning, especially since it looks like the rain has finally ended and the day is going to be pretty nice. Uh, before we get started with the program, I have a couple of items or reminders um, this coming friday and saturday we're doing gardening at lake louise state park 9 to 11 a.m have a chapter meeting on december 2nd another gardening session at uh, lake louise on december 5th um, i've got a few plants to put in the sand hill area we've been working on mm, nice. and then 
um, on December 12th, we're going to do our chapter holiday social. Um, we're going to do it on Zoom and at the December meeting, we'll sort of figure out exactly what we're going to do. I'm gonna ask all of the attendees to use the Q&A to ask questions. There should be a thumbs up button on the Q&A so you can upload a question you like. For example, if somebody asked the same question you were gonna ask. And again, thank you for joining us. Um, the Florida Native Plant Society is here to promote the preservation, conservation and restoration of the native plants and native plant communities of Florida. If you're not already a member, you can go to fnps.org and join. Our program today is uh, presented by Nancy Bissett, who's a restoration ecologist, botanist, and horticulturist. She is the co-owner of the Natives Nursery in Davenport, and she spends her time serving as a consultant, design, and installation person for upland restoration projects. She assists on research projects, monitors and surveys vegetation in Central Florida, performs rare plant surveys, and assists and advises on horticultural operations. So she really knows her stuff. And, and now I'll turn this over to Nancy. Um, she can share her screen. There it is. Thank you. Ready to go? Ready to go. Okay. I, I liked your introductory screen with all the grasses and sedges on it. Oh, dear. Um, she said that I, I uh, know a lot about these plants. Well, I learn about them probably the way you do, one at a time, and I've just been at it a long time. Um, and uh, the monitoring really, really helped with that. So the introduction, uh, there are actually four grass and grass-like families. Uh, the first, grasses, is probably the at least the second largest uh, family in the world. Um, probably asters are first. There are 463 species in Florida and over 10,000 worldwide. Rushes is a much smaller group, uh, only a couple of genera and only a few species in Florida. And sedges are actually quite widespread and numerous in Florida as well. But there is a fourth family that probably many of you have never heard of because it only occurs in the southern half of our world. South Africa is a, a real hot spot for them, but they also occur in South America and uh, Australia. So the picture on the right is actually one of the many varied and beautiful forms of restios. So it's always a big question of how do you tell these families apart? Well, all of them are monocots. The grasses are in the Poaceae family. They're characterized by having narrow blades, leaves that sheathe the stems, jointed stems, and a distinctive and somewhat complicated flowering system. Rushes um, are distinguished by cylindrical stalks or hollow stem-like leaves. And sedges characteristically have solid three-sided stems, but not always do sedges have edges. Leaves arranged in three rows and spikelets of inconspicuous flowers but the spikelets themselves can be quite interesting. 
So just to emphasize that they don't always follow the rules, this is actually a rush juncus repens that is found often on the floors of cypress bolts. And when I was monitoring and first saw this, I think it took us oh, most of the monitoring season to try and finally figure out what it was. But this is what the basal parts look like and it can even float in the water. Grasses, sedges, and rushes are found in many of our ecosystems. Wet prairies are especially diverse with many sedges, some rushes, and grasses. But sedges really star in this community. And flatwoods have a wide variety of mostly grasses. And perhaps the dominant one is the wire grass. But it gives that community stability and allows it to burn as does dry prairie. This picture was taken in central Florida and it was actually a flatwoods to begin with, but the, the uh, trees were timbered off. And so this is what remains, but dry prairies are essentially flatwoods without trees. And they do occur naturally in uh, some areas of central Florida. Sand hills are higher communities, more well, a little bit sparser. Uh, again, wire grass is a dominant. And all of these communities are really appreciated too for the diversity of wildflowers. Sometimes you get an expanse of just a single species. This is a cutthroat grass seep in central Florida. Uh, I like to show pictures like this because it shows how grasses can even be used as a substitute perhaps for a pond or a lake. It gives that smooth aspect to a landscape, smooth, continuous. So we're gonna start uh, one of the bigger grass families, the blue stems, broom sedges, or old man's beard, which in case you haven't heard, comes from andro, meaning man, and pogan, meaning beard. I said there are 21 forms and presently listed because recently this particular genus has undergone a really large change in naming. And this can be a little hard to keep up with. There also can be quite difficult to tell apart. But there are some distinctive ones. Uh, one of my favorites, short spike blue stem, andropogon brachystaceus. Uh, it's, the short spike is actually because these spikes with the florets are fairly short compared to some of the other andropogons. But I would rather call it tall willowy because that really describes what you see. The base is, has very stiff upright leaves and uh, is very bright green. So even without the flowering stems, it can be quite attractive. And here's the flowering stem who capture that willowy feel. The chalky blue stem has become a favorite in landscaping. Uh, it likes moist, sandy soil, ideally. The whole plant it can be chalky, not only just the flowering part, but the leaves as well. Anthropogon capolipes is an old name that is now the new name again. On the left, you see how we can just brighten up a landscape with the, that bright, silvery, chalky leaves. And on the right is how they're often grown in nurseries, in tubelings. Another one that we used to call big chalky blue stem has been kind of common, renamed as purple blue stem, Andropogon cretaceous. It's called purple because the base leaves sometimes have a little purplish cast to them. Now it's quite a bit taller, larger than the chalky blue stem. 
and it's not a very fussy plant. It just likes some lay soil. And again, here it is in a natural setting. Contrast that with this seeded area that has not only chalky blue stem, but also um, the rayless sunflower, Helianthus radula. And you can see some goldenrod and blazing stars in there too. Split beard blue stem, Androprogon ternarius is in sand hills and flatwoods. It's called split beard because of this, but you see the little golden um, anthers on there. It's hard to get a picture of the split in the beard because as soon as it splits open, the seeds are ready to drop. And it mostly looks like what you see on the left. And here's some pictures of the close-ups of the stems and flowers where you grasp that bright red and green um, look to the, um, we sometimes call it the Christmas grass as well. It, it, some of the other andropogons have this, but not to this extent. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of them that can be a little bit troublesome. They're too easy to grow, too easy to occupy an area and reseed. And so a few in the landscape might be a big problem. The big picture actually is a Bahia grass field, but the, um, this broom sedge or old field variant of broom sedge uh, has occupied a good part of it. So when we were working on the Bach Tower, Wet Prairie and Bog, we were having trouble growing some of the beak sedges. And so we actually harvested little clumps from an existing wet prairie that was quite pristine. Um, we, we did this in a very careful manner, of course, with the permission of the, of the owners. But the seed bank, the seeds buried in those little clumps of dirt had the old field variant of um, blue stem. And so when these plants grew out, they popped up everywhere and we had to go in and cut them back and eventually remove them uh, from the landscape so it wouldn't completely take it over. Another andropogon that can do this is this bushy blue stem, which you often see along ditches as you're driving around in the fall, uh, which is an indication again that it's more of a pioneering species and can occupy areas early. This is the bushy blue stem andropogon glomeratus variety pumulus, and it's quite beautiful. It's just that you have to be a aware that it can take over. So now we'll move on to the Threon family, the Aristidas, which you may think of as basically wiregrass, which we'll come to. But this is Aristida gyrans, and it is found in really dry, scrubby soils. I included it here because it too is a good reseeder. And if you're doing something like the restoration we're doing on this site, it will reseed over time and help occupy the area. So there's no room for things like natal grass that we don't want. Another one with somewhat of the same character is this bottle brush three on Aristides spiciformis. If you are taking walks in the fall, especially in Florida's flatwoods type areas along the edges of the paths, you may see this plant because it does have a little bit of a pioneering character and it will pop up where there's been a little disturbance. But I really like this picture on the bottom where there's a whole big field of it. And I thought, you know, this might be something that could be really useful uh, in trying to, to get an area naturalized initially. Now, wiregrass, a restricted 
perhaps the one you're most familiar with if you know a bit of Florida, because it is such an important species for those communities I had just shown you. It's called uh, three on, and here you can see the on spreading out from the stem. There are three on each seed. And the picture below is, is taken from one of our restoration uh, sites, an early one. Uh, after the site was burned about four or five years after it was seeded, and you can see how the plants have bloomed. Toothache grass is found in wet prairies. It's really neat because of that little pigtail, I call it, um, of, of bloom stalk and, and blooms where the seeds occur. But so known by chewing on the leaves at the base of the plant and it numbs your mouth just a wee bit. There aren't many grasses that do well in shade, but some of the witch grasses do. Uh, this is called variable witch grass. We used to call it Great Dane grass. We did grow it for a while. There wasn't much interest, but I see that it is now available in at least one other nursery or even by seed. And another one that can occur in the shade of live oaks uh, which I have seen again naturally occurring is another dicanthelium, Porterosensi. This one is more attractive. The other one is an easier colonizer. Uh, since we've introduced the love grasses, you may be more familiar with these. Uh, you may either love us or hate us for doing it because there is a little bit of an issue when the seed stems break off and tumble across the landscape. This one, Elliot's Love Grass, is, usually has this bluish cast to it. It doesn't necessarily have to, but most of them are. And in the lower picture, you see it in bloom. Here at Bach Tower, it's scattered through the sandhill plantings. And in the fall, it's more visible. This was in the Flatwoods area. The other love grass we introduce is a purple love grass. I'm going to go back just a moment uh, to emphasize this one factor about Elliot's. It's a very versatile grass because it actually can grow all the way from scrub soils down into being flooded for, I'm not sure how long, even a month or two, the base flooded. Uh, so it can go from very dry to very, very moist or hydric. Purple love grass isn't quite as variable that way. It likes dry, well-drained soils. And this is how it looks in the fall. It's called purple love grass for the bloom haze, but it's not quite as purplish as you would think of mooly grass being. In the fall, looking from the other direction and it's backlit, you get a different view of it as opposed to this picture. Same. The, these were taken on the same day. It was just a difference in the angle of the sun. All of these, the love grasses and the blue stems combined with silver-leaved aster can give a lot of color and texture to a landscape. Mooley grass, this one I know everybody has seen and it's very easy to fall in love with this plant. It's beautiful when it's not in bloom and it's just outstanding when it is. So mooley grass and wire grass both have wiry leaves. Mooley grass is much larger, but they're sometimes, especially when they're seedlings, they're a little harder to tell apart, but they can by this, see the arrow, this ligule is quite tall comparatively speaking, uh, for a grass. 
a lot of the characters of identifying grasses come down to very tiny measurements. So this can actually be two millimeters tall, whereas in wire grass, you really don't see it. But wire grass has a tuft of hairs at the very base of where the leaves join the stem. And if you look closely at that, you can see this tuft of hairs. This picture was taken at Archbold Biological Station in the parking lot. And uh, here you have Muli, and closer to the walk is the purple lovegrass. This is a natural field of Muli grass near uh, Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. And at Bach Tower, uh, along the little stream that separates from the wetland. Another name change. When I give this kind of talk about restoration and grasses to uh, some people, they say, oh, no, we can't do that. But many of the panicums have been changed to Colia tainia, Colia tainia anceps. There are many panicums, and some of them have been changed in this way. This one is called beaked panicum. It has a panicum-like bloom, but a real identifying character, if nothing else, is the roots have this very scaly appearance. And here it is planted at the entrance to the visitor center at Archbold. I thought it would be perfect here because it does like uh, a fair shade. Uh, and you often find it uh, in just that kind of position in a natural landscape as well as out in the open. Unfortunately, here it did not have enough water and did not persist. Maiden cane is another uh, grass that many people are familiar with, but it's not often used in a, in a home landscape um, setting. It could, however, and especially if you live near a lake. This picture was taken at Disney Wilderness Preserve, and the, almost the entire landscape you see was initially covered by torpedo grass. Uh, the torpedo grass was removed and the area was sprigged with maiden cane, and it has done quite well in that setting. There is another maiden cane called blue maiden cane, which has a darker green leaf. You can see it a little bit there. But if you hold it up next to the light, you can see this white edge, which is a real distinguishing factor for it. At the uh, not only let's see just just at the wetland area where the water from the pond was pumped up and cl it was cleaned through this area, there were slopes here and around the edge of the boardwalk that we needed to plant with something that would hold the slope as, as well as take that intermediate moisture level, and so we sprigged in this. Blue Maiden Cane. Back. So this Blue Maiden Cane likes to go somewhere along seepage areas, especially between higher, drier, and moisture levels. And the other Maiden Cane, uh, its name was changed to the Haimanaki. That maiden cane actually is listed as an obligate or a very wetland species, but it seems to actually grow all the way up into scrub and sand hill. I, um, there's a place in Lake County. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the preserve, but you can see it quite often in the upland parts there. Okay, two more panicums. I added these because they are more wetland species, Panicum longifolium, not so much. Uh, it's more of a seepage slope, 
but it's a really good species for repairing spots in wetlands. You can almost hand toss the seed. And Panicum longifolium actually has fairly attractive uh, leaves and could also be used near edges. The giant plume grass has a particular majesty. Um, it's it's um, six to eight feet tall, I would say. You can even cut it when it's in this stage before it is totally fluffed out and put it in vases. And the picture on the right is actually from one of my bouquets I've had in my house for a number of years. Lopsided Indian grass, that's the October special. Uh, Lopsided Indian grass blooms in the middle of October, depends on the area, early to mid. And the seed will only stay on the stalks for about a week to 10 days. So it has to, you know, when we're collecting seed, we have to do this early but such a striking grass in bloom. Here you see close-ups in bloom, and it's those long awns that hang down and away from the stem that give it the name lopsided. This, these pictures are still in bloom. You can see the yellow anthers hanging down. And a few more pictures from seeded areas. The lower one is actually from Archbold Biological Station. There are several cord grasses or sporobolis. And you actually, I'm sure, have seen this. Actually, it occurs most often when you're coming down from uh, flatwoods where there's saw palmetto and so on, and then when it drops down below that, you come to the uh, sand cord grass wet prairie. At Bok Tower, we used it along the boardwalk. You can see how large it is, especially even comparing it to the giant fern here. So you have to consider the spread of this glass when you're, grass when you're uh, planting it out. Give it room, you know, three to five feet, four feet might be about ideal. And still, you will get a full cover. So the next two uh, cord grasses, salt marsh and with smooth and salt metal cord grasses, the two species are intermingled here. This was taken up in um, north of Steen Hatchie. And you can also see some of the black rush in the background. These were called Spartinas. Their names have been changed to Sporobolis. This one is smooth cord grass, occurs on saltwater beaches, tidal marshes, and flats. And this one is called salt metal cord grass, goes even up into the beach dunes and also down into brackish and salt, salty marshes. So they sort of interconnect, but here you can see the smooth cord grass on the left is just in a little wetter habitat then where in this restoration, the salt metal cord grass is being planted. Uh, this is uh, a required restoration site, restoring where a, I think it was a battery plant existed at one time. Another grass I'm sure you've seen, Tripsicum dactyloides, Pakahatchee grass, very large, robust clump. Even though it's called Fakahatchee grass, this grass grows all the way to the middle of our country. And it's especially beautiful in bloom. We don't often get a chance to observe those tiny little details. The other interesting thing is this is the seed. You see how it's kind of stacked up in a row? This is one of those grasses that, like corn, was a 
earlier um, form of grasses. And sea oats, this is our, our last grass. I thought it was a fitting one to end up with. Probably the only time you may be interested in this is if you actually, for, for landscaping, is if you live near the coast. But it's a beautiful way to um, spend on the beach and move on to the next category. So did you want to end, uh, put the question in at this point or should I move on? Okay, I'll move on. So I've neglected my black, last couple of times I presented this is to include the benefits to wildlife. And there are many. Uh, there are actually some butterflies like the skipper that grasses are a larval uh, plant food for. And small birds like the Florida grasshopper sparrow uh, actually will feed on those tiny seeds of even andropogons. The Florida grasshopper sparrow is a highly endangered uh, uh, bird species that they have now. The Florida um, wildlife has begun raising in captivity and reintroducing to the wild because the numbers were so low. Moving on to the rush family. And uh, we'll just talk about two of them, but two that are fairly common. The soft rush is actually a worldwide species, the entire world. It occurs naturally. I see in the picture on the right, it's actually called the subspecies here. And these were planted in that little stream between the wetland and the pond at Bach Tower. The other one is black needle rush, which in this picture looks quite black. Uh, if you are traveling north of Florida through Georgia on uh, I-75, you cross those great big areas of black needle rush that are so impressive. This picture was actually taken near Steam Hatchet, so we have it too. This was taken actually in the same area. And here you see a band of really bright green grass. That's probably one of the uh, sprobles that I showed you earlier. And here it is in a restoration planting again. However, I would really be cautious about where you would use this in a landscape because it's called needle rush for a reason. The tips are so sharp they could definitely poke you and uh, be cautious about eye pokes, especially. This is called giant bulrush, but we're not in the rush family anymore. We are now in the sedges. And like I've said before, sedges don't always have edges. The giant bulrush here called uh, Californicus you sometimes see plant a little deeper water uh, out from the very edge around lakes and ponds. And it doesn't there form a thick stem like you see on the left. It's much more, um, uh, looks much more open and quite tall. Here's another Eliochorus, another spike rush, again, a sedge. And this one is, again, often used in restoration. The way I chose the plants to discuss in this program was which ones were available commercially. And so even though some of these have been used mostly in restoration, and they certainly could be used in the home landscape or business as well, um, this is how they have been most frequently used in the past. White top sedge, however, uh, is a little more petite plant and 
it's those showy white bracts that make it attractive. This one is only a little over a foot, 12 inches. Um, and here is the giant white top sedge. And it's about two feet tall, and the white bracts are very noticeable. Early on, we planted this in the wet prairie at Bach Tower Gardens, and it was so showy all summer long. I don't know why, but it had not persisted real well. I don't know if it short-lived, or even though we planted it in a fairly moist area, it may not have been moist enough. When I thought Grandma was asked to please talk about the Carex, uh, genus and we had not really used Carex much in Florida but it's so widely used in other parts of our country. Here we're collecting seed from the Carex that we're seeding on a restoration site nearby and since it was a while ago I'm not positive the idea but I think it's Carex varicosa or warty sedge. It's just one of 70 that are native species um, in Florida, mostly on wet soils. If you are driving in the off-road, or I guess in country, dirt-covered roads only, often in the moisture spots, especially you see this very low, flat ground cover. And it's called road grass for that reason but it's actually a small sedge with very fine wiry stems. And it will, the stems will lean over and root again. So it does spread as well. I have to tell the story a little bit. Uh, when we were doing the restoration uh, and planting the landscape at Archbold Biological Station, part of the area used to be a tennis court and and Dr. Hillary Swain thought it would be nice to still have that opportunity when this particular area that was supposed to be sort of the wetland catchment when there was a lot of rain wasn't too wet in the winter months and they could actually play tennis on it. But again, where we got the source of this seed, we were absolutely amazed at the amount of other plants that were stored by seed in the seed bank and came up. So where can you find these plants? Here's a beautiful wet prairie and citrus or pitcher plant bog in North Florida. But a good share of the grass-like vegetation is actually one of the many beak sedges, Rhynchospora species. Rhynchospora microcephala and Rhynchospora chapmanii and many others we also planted in the wet prairie bog at Bog Tower. Bog gardens are awfully fun to create even in a home landscape. Here, um, ball garden and wet prairie planting at Bach Tower. We'll use many of these beak sedges. And here they are seeded in a wet prairie in Pasco County. Here's the head right there, very tiny. And in a wet prairie down in Hendry County for the Florida Wildlife Commission. So simple techniques, which you all know just from, I, I think you're probably most of you are avid gardeners, but for these plants, typically do not enrich the soil. If you think your plant needs a little kick, put the, put the um, fertilizer in the bottom, tip the containers out rather than pulling them uh, sometimes uh, these plants do not have real sturdy uh, root masses. They go over size hole and we always hand tuck. Of course, uh, the way nature manages these landscapes, these grass covered, I call them um, savannas if they have some trees, is by burning. 
and uh, the burns used to occur naturally when we didn't have roads, roads and other things to interrupt uh, the landscape once it caught fire via lightning. So now much of the burning happens on a uh, managed scale. And here we're burning as our seeded landscape. And this is what it looks like after the burn, where you can see the wire grass and other things starting to bloom. So how can you do this in a place where you certainly don't want to burn? This was uh, uh, a wild fire and grass planting, um, wildflower meadow, where you have the walking pathway, a strip of bahia, and then the wildflowers and grasses. And here you see the difference that a mowing at particular times of the year can make. And we usually stress mowing at about eight inches, it can be a little shorter, but don't scalp the ground, especially for clump grasses. And it'll extend the weed, it'll, it'll reduce the weedy look and will extend the flowering period. Uh, if I, I would say one of the key times might be the middle of summer, uh, say late, late July, maybe early August, and that will still give a chance for these clump grasses to send up blooms in the winter, but might knock back things that you don't want to go to seed. Another way to manage them would be to rake out the dead grasses with a garden rake. Uh, grasses don't need to be tended to all the time. They, they uh, are perfectly fine as they are. If you do wish to neaten them up, if you're getting too much duff at the base, this is one way you can handle it. If you do need to cut them back, we suggest cutting them quite low, just a couple inches tall. If you have traveled the uh, the um, Greenway around Orlando, for example, you see that they often cut grass about a foot plus tall, and it looks very, very unnatural. Here are some pictures of uh, various sites we have done and what they look like often in the fall. This was a scrubby flatwoods. This is a planted uh, flatwoods, a small area at Bach Tower. A seeded wire grass at Reedy Creek. This was a mitigation bank. The planted sand hill at Bach Tower. This was probably um, later summer. And here it is in the fall. The neat thing about these landscapes is they change so much through the seasons and you get a chance to uh, notice uh, plants at different stages. And planted grasses and wildflowers. Seeded sandhill. Another seeded sandhill in the middle of the green swamp. And for the same site, actually. Here are children playing in the plantings at um, Archbold Biological Station. And that is the last slide. Thank you so much for listening. I do want to give a shout out to the many photographers who helped by contributing pictures and to both the Florida Wildflower Foundation and the Florida Association of Native Nurseries to help it, to gather these pictures and uh, help put this on. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to launch this poll because I couldn't get my act together earlier. <laughs> I don't know if I didn't stop at the right point or what. So I just kept going. <laughs> the, um, we figure everyone knows and likes muley grass, but 
based on this, answer the question, what other types of grasses piqued your interest? Okay, I'm going to end the polling. It looks like blue stems 50%. Oh, good. Love grass is 38%, and lopsided Indian grass 56%. So most people. Um, are interested in the lopsided mm -hmm. Indian grass, which is which is pretty tall but pretty spectacular when it's blooming. I'll have to add uh, a little note there. Uh, lopsided Indian grass, when we're collecting the seed or working with the seed, we find we get itchy in the soft spots like our crook of our elbow or around our neck. And it's, it's an irritation that goes away when you wash. But, but uh, the people who work with it put scarves around their neck, et cetera, so it doesn't irritate. It, it's a minor problem. That's I'm gonna, grass, isn't it? I'm going to launch another poll real quick just to see if everyone was paying attention in the beginning. Ah. Uh, which genera mostly have cylindrical stems? All right. One question I thought of asking, but, but I knew it was too close to the beginning. But I was going to say, how many grass and grass-like families are there? So that's, you, All right. you see those polling results? Mm -hmm. So did everyone get the right answer? Oh, yeah. Grushes. And okay. if you look hard enough, you could say that probably all three do it, one, one species or another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's go on to the Q&A. So first question, what grasses would you suggest for erosion control at a canal edge? So probably the one that would be the fastest growing and will fill out um, covering the area, uh, first one that popped into my mind would be the uh, maiden cane, Panicum hematomum. But yeah, I, I guess it depends on how fast erosion might happen because even things like um, cordgrass, the um, Spartina bakeri, I, I don't have the current name, I'm not quite up on that, uh, but because it's such a, a massive plant and has a heavy cover, it would, but it would need time to grow out. So sometimes that's a, a, a factor that is difficult to, to realize uh, when you need erosion control right away. So first choice probably main cane. Okay, um, second question. Is the Fakahatchee grass in our neighborhood and adjacent areas turns brown starting at the tips? 
The landscape crew then cuts it down to about 18 inches and the new mm -hmm. growth starts out okay, but then browns out after a month or two. Do you know what's going mm -hmm. on wrong? Uh, I have to say, I don't know. I've never seen it. I think uh, asking your local um, agent with the agriculture department might be the best way to go to, to find an answer to that. And, and I, the thought that they cut it back to 18 inches gives me the shivers. It must not look very nice. Um, next question, what's the irrigation schedule for new plantings? So how- well, That's variable. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we <laughs> irrigation schedule, I guess it depends on the soil type, time of year, et cetera. But I would, I would water sufficiently to keep the, the mass of soil where the roots are moist and uh, when we're when we're planting in natural areas we usually don't have the uh, restoration areas we usually don't have that option of, of a wide scale um, irrigation system so we very closely watch monitor the soil moisture and then we'll hand water as needed uh, th that to me is kind of ideal. I just would not overwater, uh, even in the beginning. Uh, I would think if you water the plants in when, when they're planted, even every other day initially, and then start loosening up, and that depends on the time of year. My one caution is that you have to remember, especially in central Florida, our harshest time of the year are the spring months. April, May, before the summer rains start. So if you are planting then, you need to be extra careful with your irrigation. Sorry, it's not a specific water, 30 minutes for every day, et cetera, but you can't do it that. Um, an observation, those of us allergic to grasses have to limit what we plant. Um, are there any grasses that don't prompt allergic reaction, people who are normally allergic? Hmm. Trying to think of what grasses, of course, it's the pollen yeah. that the grasses produce that are irritating. Um, and good share of our native grasses are fall bloomers. So it might be a matter of restricting uh, bloom growth at that time of year by mowing or whatever, cutting back. Um, and, and because they're mainly fall bloomers, it's not like a, a lawn grass is going to bloom over and over again. Um, do rushes and sedges have the same pollen issues? Probably. Uh, they're all basically wind pollinated, yes. And whenever a plant is wind pollinated, you know, which is why goldenrods really aren't a culprit, but it's more things like ragweed and, and therefore the grasses and grass lakes that, are, that spread their pollen by the wind. They produce a lot of pollen and it's usually very light so the wind can carry it. And that's where the problems occur. Okay, and another member asks, um, lopsided Indian grass flourished in the western exposure of my sandhill yard only for two years. What's the secret to having it return? My other grasses continue to provide beauty and habitat for years. Hmm. I, I think lopsided Indian grass is not a real long-lived plant, but it certainly should live longer than two years. In fact, uh, lopsided Indian grass, if it's in a natural landscape, when it's burned, 
it doesn't bloom that year. It doesn't bloom till the year after. And the heavy blooms usually are from like year two to year five. Um, and I don't have a real good knowledge of how long they normally last. I, I would definitely be careful of um, uh, over fertilizing perhaps. Uh, over watering shouldn't be too much of a problem making sure that it's planted at the right depth. And, and one way to help with, you know, grasses are crowns. They, they, they start uh, the, the upward portion right at the base and the roots go down from there. And so overplanting could be a, a big issue. I'm not saying that you don't know how to plant, however you probably do, but just be really cautious of that and mulching. So, so it doesn't like mulch? No, any of these clump grasses, you want to be careful not to mulch over. Because, because the leaves spread out over the ground, you don't want to mulch over part of the crown. You want to lift it up and not stack heavy mulch, mulch right around the base of the plant. Okay. Just like you do for a while. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. Um, another question, why, what would you suggest for erosion control on the dry lower edges of a property sloped, um, of a sloped property near a street? So erosion control, dry lower edges of a sloped property. So usually dry in Florida means fairly sandy, deep sandy. And I don't think quick erosion is quite as much of a problem there. And I would go with some of these clump grasses like wire grass, love grasses, and so on that, that uh, yeah or even a combination of those. It would take a little while to grow out. Uh, the love grasses grow out much more quickly than the wire grass, but I think it would make a nice combination planting. Okay, question. Does muley grass ever reseed itself in the home landscape? I've had them for years, but they do not seem to reseed. Um, we did some seeding out. Actually, it was uh, for a, a uh, golf course complex on old restored land. Um, and we were asked to seed wire grass around uh, a planting of muley grass. And when we went out there to look, I thought, oh my goodness, the wire grass is really coming up. But it wasn't, it was the muley grass. And the reason it did, I know why the wire grass didn't, but the reason the muley grass did so well is because they had irrigated so frequently. And I, I think that's the difference. Um, if if you uh, make sure if if you if you want to collect the seed, you have to make sure that the the flowering stems are no longer purplish. That's the easiest way to tell. I always look at it under the microscope, but if you if you pick the seed while it's still purplish, uh, the seed isn't ripe, and so that could be a factor. But it sounds like you're just talking about reseeding within the landscape. And it could be uh, not continuous moisture, which it would take to germinate. Okay. Um, another, another member commented, much success with digging up and dividing. I'm assuming that's the cost. Yep, you can always do that with, yeah. You can do that with most of these clump grasses. Um, of course, if, if you're in production like we are, that's fairly expensive way to do it. Seeding for us is, is much easier and quicker. 
But division, yes, you can do that. Okay. And then somebody else asks, are there any grasses more, more easily propagated by an amateur when they gather um, their homegrown plants, making more muley grass, for instance? So which grasses are the most easily propagated? Propagated. Yeah. Love grasses are definitely easy. Um, Wire grass takes a long to germinate, so you have to keep that soil moist at the surface for a longer period of time. Um, lots of the Indian grass is actually quite easy. And what's neat about it is when you put the seed on the soil and that the soil is moist, you usually cover it a little lightly, the soil is moist, or when you moisten it, you can see the whole seed mass start to um, wrinkle and, and twist and turn. It looks like it's alive. It's because those awns are twisting, and that's one of the mechanisms that used naturally to bury itself. Interesting. Um, I have a, uh, another question. My love grass, the, um, the spikes with the seeds on them break off and it's like I have tumbleweeds all over <laughs> my, my property. Is that mm -hmm. the way they spread their seeds? It most definitely is. And I usually put plants and grasses are a good example into into categories. There, there are some plants that are just weedy, they're usually annual, and then there are the pioneering species that take hold fairly quickly in a disturbed area, uh, and, and so that's the next category. Now when I talked about the andropogons, the old field variant of uh, andropogon virginicus, and the one that you see in the ditches, those are pioneering species, and they, so that's what they're designed to do. They reseed rather readily. Now I can't remember what the question was, so I hope <laughs> I am. <laughs> oh, I was asking about the tumbleweeds and we were yes. asking about propagation. Okay, right. So love grasses kind of belong in a little bit in that pioneering group as well. Yeah. That's how they spread their seed and, and their seeds are very tiny. If you actually rub the 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 seed area you get down to this very very tiny little seed so it can just lie on the surface and germinate does it need to be covered okay and the last question are there grasses that have properties that keep other plants from growing around them such as set the mm. chemical defenses uh no um, I, I'm not aware of any of the grasses that do that. Of course, you sometimes think <laughs> some of these weedy grasses like um, Kogan grass are so aggressive, but that's not how they operate. Um, they just spread by rhizomes and also germinate from seed rather readily. So it's more robust growth, like those two weedy andropogons I talked about and Kogan grass. Um, and natal grass in drier soils, yeah. So they just sort of crowd out other plants? Correct, yeah. Okay. okay. By that, faster growth. That is the last of the questions. So unless anybody else has a question they want to ask. I want to thank Nancy very, very much. Um, tell me, do you um, at the natives carry a broader selection of grasses than um, someone might find at another native nursery? Uh, we do grow a lot of different grasses. Uh, a lot of it is for, um, restoration, et cetera. And of course we do a lot of seeding, but 
this year, maybe not in the future, but this year we are not selling retail. Okay. It's just, you know, for protection and um, just switching focus right now. So we'll see. But, you know, we can always sell wholesale to other nurseries if they right. are anxious to expand their list. And um, question, will recording of this webinar be made available? Um, I am recording it and will post it on the Passion Flower website um, within a couple of days. It will be under the past activity news. Um, there should there will be a link to um, to the recording. And everyone says thank you very much, Nancy. A very interesting presentation. You're most welcome. I, I kind of like th this whole 2020 has had some benefits. And I certainly enjoy listening to other people's webinars. So <laughs> I'm glad this is, we, we are in this era at least and can do this. And I enjoy presenting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's see.